It says it's going, setting it up. Okay, so um, Brian and I had a little bit of technical technical difficulties with uh, the BeLive app again. It just does, it doesn't like us for some reason for us to talk, but um, for those of you who don't know, this is Brian May. Uh, he is uh, doing what he can for us in local county government. Um, Brian, can you tell people again your position and what it is that you do? Good morning, Shelly. Thank you. Yeah, I'm the, uh, I'm the District 1 legislator, which is all of the town of Lysander and uh, part of the northwest or western edge of the town of Clay. Um, and I'm also uh, the majority leader for uh, for the legislature as well. Okay, and um, and you spoke to us. I don't know about a month ago, maybe. You know, with mm -hmm. um, with some topics, and I reached out to you and just said, you know, there's so much that goes on, especially now with COVID. And you did give me quite a few um, topics to cover today. So if you don't mind, if we can dive into those, I Let's know. Get right um, to it. About, talked about the community development uh, steering committee and what what's going on there. So. Um, give us give us an idea. I know that you help, uh, especially Lysander, with that, correct? Right, right, right. So I, mean, I think the first important thing to talk about is what the Community Development Office does for Onondaga County. Uh, the Community Development Office is largely grant funded, mostly federal grant money, actually. Um, and they do a variety, administer a variety of really significant programs for uh, the residents of Onondaga County, uh, the towns, the villages, the the people who actually own homes and live here, um, they do some great stuff. They have, you know, they're really uh, significantly responsible for lead abatement uh, in the county, lead remediation in homes. They administer that program for the federal government. Um, they have a home repair program, people who are uh, impoverished and, and, and need help to do really important capital repairs. They help people get those repairs done so they have a place to to live that's safe and habitable for themselves and their family. Um, they also do many other things, but the, 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 the issue at hand today is the Community Development Block Grant Program Administration. And that program has a, a steering committee of people from around the community who um, um, town supervisors, village mayors, uh, Chairman Dave Knapp and me from the legislature uh, and several others who uh, coordinate the distribution of about, uh, every year it's different because it's funded by the federal government, uh, one to two or even $3 million in grant money that gets distributed out into our villages and towns to improve neighborhoods, to fix infrastructure. Um, it, it's a tricky process for this committee and for the Office of Community Development because it uh, um, it's based on economic qualifications. So uh, by census track, the federal government determines where this money can go. And in the case of, of the town of Lysander, um, you know, we're very, very limited as to where we qualify. Our average income in Lysander is, uh, we're fortunate to have it be a little higher than average. That being said, there are very few places where the money can be uh, allocated here in the town. Most towns, villages, any park, for example, um, can receive money. And while Lysander in the past has received money for Lysander Park and other types of projects, um, this year, Lysander Park is not qualified. And in the past, certain types of progress projects will also qualify and others will not. So um, it's a tricky process. And I know the town with its limitations this year um, was, having a great deal of difficulty finding something that qualified. So we kind of, Supervisor Wicks and I put our heads together a little bit and, and finally found something, a road project, if you will, that, that, that helps. And again, um, and it, well, how, how does it help? You know, Lysander's gonna get, uh, well, we haven't approved it yet, um, but Lysander is applying for a project that can be offset by anywhere from, the way this works is uh, typically, Fifty to one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars would be allocated to a qualified project. Those bigger spends tend to be for bigger projects. Um, 
And some of those projects include like major park renovations in Salve or Geddes or Camillus or, or what have you, areas that qualify. You know, again, Lysander were limited, so it was very difficult to find. They had a great idea for the park, didn't fly um, with the, the qualifications and economic situation. And we're gonna do some road work that supports infrastructure development in an area that again, qualifies for uh, economic reasons. So great program, great group of people that do the work. And um, I mean, I'm personally just happy that, that I was able to help the town uh, coordinate something because in the past, um, it's there have been times where year to year, we here in Lysander have not been able to pursue those dollars. So, so I just, and you, you may have explained this and I just missed it, Brian, but you said sometimes the park qualifies and sometimes it doesn't qualify, like this year it didn't qualify and we qualify for the road. So what's the, if it comes down to like our income and stuff, what, what's that different? What, what piece am I missing that the park didn't qualify, but the road project does? So Is that something you can explain? It's, it's the location. So if the census tract uh, reaches a certain income level then that area just doesn't qualify. So even if you've got a park there that would otherwise, oh, even there's always work you can do, ADA compliance, things like that, trails, what, what have you that help people um, take advantage of the resources the town has to offer or village or whatever, um, we just couldn't do it there. So um, um, again, we're very, very limited in Lysander. So thanks to the uh, Marty Skein who, who runs the community development office, um, you know, helped us kind of focus the effort a little bit to find something to apply for that I feel pretty good. We'll probably have a chance of getting um, something and anything we can get for the town is, especially in the way of infrastructure work, Shelley, is a direct offset to um, what people pay in, in their town taxes. So that's a good thing. So we're putting tax dollars, federal tax dollars to use in town to either offset work or um, uh, do more, depending on the financial circumstances of a given year. Sometimes we are funded very well in the town, sometimes not so much. Um, either way, it's it's of significant benefit to the taxpayers in town, residents. Okay. When will you like? When will that be decided? Who's getting those 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 uh, uh, money? Yeah, so we start the uh, deliberations toward the end of this month, October, where the committee gets together. It'll be a little different this year because it's a virtual process. Naturally, it's a lot of people. I think there's there's probably 12 or 15 people on this committee. Um, it's going to be virtual versus in person. And normally, um, these applications that come in are kind of involved. So there's there's uh, a lot of photographs, a lot of visuals plan review, things like that with each project. So we're gonna be doing it visually. We're starting at the end of the month and hopefully by the end of November, we'll have an idea of where the awards are gonna be. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I'm definitely learning more about, you know, the, the types of um, committee and where his money is, um, where it's put to go. Cause we had talked about the Main Street grant project last time. And I know, you know, when I spoke to you, I was a little bit worried about that money coming and I'm sure you're aware of it, but if anybody else is not, uh, Gary Peters, um, Gary Peterson, he finished the sports bowl. That was one of the main street grant projects and he, he's already gotten his money back. So mine's still in the process, but I know that it was definitely a warm, fuzzy feeling to know that somebody had received that, that money. And, and like I said, last month, um, those types of commitments by Onondaga County and Shelly, believe me, some of them have been very significant. Um, um, they're all being followed through on. The difference this year, naturally, is time and bandwidth. So we're, um, we, like I'm doing the work, the county <laughs> is, <laughs> is um, you know, focused on a lot of different things. A lot of people have been repurposed across county government to um, aiding and assisting with the COVID process and all that's associated with it. So things aren't moving as fast as anyone would like, but everything is moving. And the folks that work for the county are doing a fantastic job uh, doing so. And like I said, some of the commitments um, of in that vein have been very significant to the tune of millions. And um, in not Main Street projects, but but those the, the spirit and nature of the project has been very similar. And uh, where we have a commitment, we're making good on those commitments uh, because we said we would. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and, and, and people, you know, they count on it. But at the same time, I think a, a lot of us understand the situation that we're in and where does that money need to be spent? And does it need to be, you know, somebody who is just maybe a resident in Baldwinsville and sees the money going towards a building might think that, you know, it should have been put somewhere else. But you definitely did a good job of explaining to me and the mayor and Bob Wicks have as well is saying, this is where the money was supposed to go. They, it, it takes a lot to move money from where they said it was going to go to go to somewhere else. You know? Absolutely. And when, when there's public dollars behind a project, and this is the thing that a lot of people just don't know, if you were going to throw a shed in your backyard, you know, um, you could go somewhere, buy it. Maybe you got a little codes work to do, a visit to the codes office or whatever, quick approval and boom, you're done, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not so when there's public dollars at hand, you know, there's, there's everything from um, different compliance and regulation to uh, loan administration process or money grant administration process that's extraordinary uh, construction standards that are typically different, yeah. uh, ADA requirements that are typically higher. Um, it, it goes, the list goes on and on. And that's why things cost more for government, which I don't agree with, but they do. They cost more for government to do certain things than it would um, the average person. Yeah, and, and I've had that before. Um, so, so going to the next topic, which you know you had mentioned about even that committee, they're meeting virtually, right? Yeah. Because of COVID and stuff. Um, you guys are working on something else as far as streaming um, right. meetings. So um, last month, September session, general session of the legislature, we passed a resolution um, to approve live streaming of our general legislative sessions. Um, I co-sponsored that along with, I believe, every other legislator. Okay, good idea. Um, there's some debate over exactly how to do it. It seems like there's always debate. You know, what do you, what do, you do as government, <laughs> as politics, whatever. But um, the original proposal that came through uh, by legislator uh, Wells, uh, now we've been talking about this for a couple of years, Shelly, do, doing it. And one of the reasons we haven't is that the original proposals were very cost prohibitive. And a lot of those proposals were generated by the private sector. And, you know, just like you and I are doing right now, I mean, things can be done in a little more grassroots, um, um, do it yourself kind of fashion and have it be okay. Um, but the thing that was debated most was, all right, to what level are we going to broadcast legislative activity? Right. And the original proposal wanted everything, our legislative committees, the, um, um, by that I mean the program committees of the legislature itself, where legislators are with department heads and other representatives are deliberating, and also um, um, committees that are uh, administered and appointed by the legislature. Like I sit on, uh, as one example, um, and this is pr probably one of my favorite committees, is the Agricultural and Farmland Protection Board. And it's a ton of work. Uh, basically, we are helping uh, preserve viable farmland for um, um, forever, trying to keep it in productive farming. Agriculture is a major, major part of our economy in New York State. Um, a lot of people don't really know it or understand that. And you've got to keep the good land in farming. And one way to do that is with incentives to uh, mitigate pressure from uh, development developers. So they do some great work on that committee. It's, it's a phenomenal process, but it's all volunteers. It's all people from the community. It's farmers, it's land planners, it's uh, government representatives such as myself and, and others. Uh, Brian Reeves right here from Beeville is the chairman of that committee, does a phenomenal okay. job. But the point is, um, I'm drifting, I apologize. The <laughs> point is that, that these are all volunteers and they're not signing up to be broadcaster, they're signing up to do some work that's really going to benefit our community. And we don't want to change that dynamic. Uh, the cool thing about the legislative committees and the legislative program committees is they're documented very well. The activity is memorialized through minutes. And if you ever want to know anything that's going on, go to ongov.net, go to the legislative web website, and you're going to see um, exactly where the work is being done. You'll even see who's doing the work, okay, in terms of who's weighing in on the topics and issues. Um, where the issues of debate are and so on. But with general session, we don't have that um, quite the same requirement and those meetings are during the day and it's hard for the regular public to see um, 
a vote or a process and they want to or a presentation or whatever. And by live streaming our legislative session, we're adding a tremendous amount of transparency to our process. Uh, we're giving the public access should they want it. Um, they'll be sitting up on the web uh, for I think a year afterwards for people to review, even if they don't catch it live, they can go look at it. I mean, this isn't rocket science or anything, but it's of high value to residents who may be concerned or interested in an issue. Um, well, and you had, you had mentioned when we talked the other day, if, you know, if I wrote to you about a concern that I have and I wanted to know which way you were thinking or what you were saying about it, it's a way for me to um, just kind of see, did I make a difference? Did my letter make a difference? Did you even take into my concerns into consideration? So, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on you, honestly, for you guys to go live, but I, but I think it's a good thing. So that way you can't come and say, hey, you know, Shelly, I tried, but eh, it didn't, you know what I mean? Like I could actually watch, watch you, correct? Am I correct in that no that's a, that's that's exactly right and you can see how how things are, are deliberated you know i'll say you know um this about general session of the ledge it's um in many respects but for the votes it's very ceremonial uh in nature it's a process the work gets done in program committees that's where you see legislators or can can actually see how people are deliberating and how those interests are being um, um addressed you know in, in the process but session can be very important especially when there's a big issue um that's before the legislature that draws a lot of public interest um unfortunately it also draws a lot of political interest and that's where you see the lion's share of of um of, of, of viewership at times but um still at the same time um, that transparency is critical and that's why we passed it no, I think it's great. And, I, and, and it's interesting that it was actually something that was pre COVID. You guys were thinking about it, you know, live streaming anyway. It oh, kind yeah. of shows oh, yeah. where, where thing, you know, things were going. But do you, do you think COVID pushed it through faster or do you just think that it was coming regardless? Sure, because COVID actually enabled us by law to um, stream our meetings, to do meetings virtually. We did that for a while when during the full shutdown. Yeah. And um, um, so it really kind of paved the way for proving to us that a more, you know, cost efficient sort of homegrown approach, Facebook Live, YouTube, you know, something along those lines or both um, is how we're going to do it. And it, it can work, you know? Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So I, um, the other topic that you had, had brought up is obviously one that a lot of people are interested in. And that's um, kind of the finance side, where we stand at the county as yeah. far as um, budgeting and and cuts. And you know, it's, again, we talked a little bit yesterday. I found it very interesting. Um, you know, so I know you're going to repeat a lot of things to them that you said to me, but um, but I, but I, I thought that um, you know overall there was a lot of thought and stuff that went into it. But kind of, can you start like with the beginning, what you thought was going to happen, and kind of walk through just like you did with me yesterday? Yeah, sure. You know, so um, no secret, right? COVID's been tough on everyone. Um, certainly been tough on local government. Uh, you know, revenue has uh, significantly been impacted. And I'm always careful not to use the word revenue and government because, I mean, on the, in accounting terms, revenue is income, right? But we don't make money, we tax for money. And I always want to make that distinction. But when COVID started, there was a big guessing game as to what kind of actual impact would, would occur. And, you know, when it started, there was a talk of a $25 million loss of revenue and a $1.3 billion budget. Uh, we could figure out something, right? Um, but as time went on, those discussions started ramping up to $150 million, no joke. And, and it, was, it, was, it was part of the narrative. And the number, very conveniently, was very big when somebody really, really needed something to go a certain way, and it was really small when something didn't quite matter as much. So it was opportunistically used, but the truth of the matter is, hotels shut down, all right? Room occupancy tax wasn't generated. The sales tax associated with that as just one example, bottomed out. Sales tax associated with car sales, which ceased, okay? just stop dead, yep. um, gone. And now we're talking millions upon millions of dollars. And that room occupancy tax money, as an example, that's used to fund 
our Convention and Visitors Bureau, which markets this area, that's used to fund the On Center, which brings groups in, that's used to fund um, a, a, a small portion, well, actually not a super small portion, but a portion is used to fund the arts in Central New York. The things that make Central New York a destination, the things that make Central New York um, uh, a great place to live. So all of those things were impacted. State aid was impacted. The federal government dropped, um, um, sent money out to enhance uh, um, and fortify Medicaid, uh, uh, the Medicaid process. Well, in New York, um, that was picked off by New York State on a technicality where um, the state was able to actually keep the money that would otherwise have gone to Onondaga County because we weren't less than 450,000 people and we were we weren't more than 450,000 and uh, I'm tongue-tied. <laughs> So, I know what you're saying. You're, we're, we're stuck in the middle, but <laughs> we, 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 our central New York region, Onondaga County, um, um, fell in a space between 450 and 500,000 people, which is crazy, which let the money stay with the state and a very small single digit number of counties in the state were able to, um, did not receive that additional revenue. So Shelly, you add all this stuff up, you add up the time that's gone by and um, you know, we know now and estimate that the revenue loss is going to be somewhere between 70 and $75 million for 2020. That's a, that's a really big number. It, it, you know, it's, it's a really big number. And, you know, but going back to what you said, when you were like at 150 million, I mean, it, so it, it's, it's a huge number. It's a, it's a, big difference than where we thought we were going to end up, if that makes sense. Yep. So if we just started in the beginning saying, hey, I think it's going to be 50 million and it winds up being 75 million, you're like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? My my hope would be that when you were having meetings and talking about things and you were gearing for the 150, the fact that it's 75 million, you know, made it so you had some um, insight on what you could do and make exactly. some changes. So that makes Exactly. And, and, you know, and from day one, um, Chairman Knapp and I, in particular, have had uh, regular dialogue with the county executive every step of the way because, you know, you go through a three-week painstaking process of creating a budget for a given year, and, you know, you budget X number of dollars, you spend all of them, you tax, and you go through the process again the next year. And so you're always working from dollar one with every new budget that you that you create. Now there's a little bit of reserve, 10% built in, but by and large, you're spending everything that you you make. You just you only tax for what you need to fund the cost of government, principally. Um, since March, you know the county executive uh, and the administration and the legislature, with its with the legislature's cooperation, has been making constant decisions, changing change um, decisions and changes to affect or improve our overall cost of government. Um, services have been shut down, aspects of the county government um, are shut down or limited. I talked about people being repurposed earlier. Um, bottom line, Shelly, the last number I heard, and I know it's more now, was about 35 million in, in a variety of different austerity measures um, to just cut our costs. So we have seasonal part-time people. They have not been used, okay, because a lot of those part-time purposes um, don't exist because things have been closed, shut down, or limited. Uh, so we just, we're not using them and not incurring those expenses, but it takes formal action to cease some of that stuff, you know? Okay. So we've done that. We've, um, um, there was a, and you, I think I talked about it last time I voted against it. There was a tax on residential energy created in the middle of the year as a means to raise a few million dollars to offset this now $75 million or $70 million loss. Um, I voted against it because it was, um, it, was it, it didn't do enough. And again, our job as government is to fund government a certain way. Um, at the, when we issue a tax bill, that's our kind of bond or contract with the community. And, um, our job in this circumstance was to make it work with the resources we have. And I felt that that tax was not um, really a great move. But again, others felt differently and it passed. And I respect that. 
Um, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I respect it. And um, it's kind of an all hands on deck, anything goes situation to keep county government moving forward um, at a time when, you know, staffing, Shelly, I mean, way back in the Pierrot administration, there were 5,000 people working for a county government. 5,000, way back, you know, it mo the, the Mahoney administration took what was then inherited maybe 4,000, it was dropped to 3,000. That's where we are today. So there's been a lot of cuts. That means the sheriff's department's running lean and mean, everybody's running lean and mean. We've um, got out of certain businesses that we shouldn't have been in um, or that we can't be in any longer, like the nursing home business, Van Dyne, for example. Um, the, the government made it so that we can't be in that business anymore. By that, I mean state government. And um, so lots and lots of cuts, lots and lots of measures to um, get to that first $35 million. Again, I know it's more than that today, but that's the number I know that I can share with you right now. Um, all those little things have been done. And, you know, kids still can't get a book from the library by walking in and looking around. They're all closed, right? So there's just a lot of things shut down. A lot of tough decisions have been made. We're at a point now where to bridge the gap all the way, we have more things we need to do. And this final measure of austerity became a very interesting, very hotly debated issue. But as with anything in government, um, once you've exhausted every other uh, means to reduce costs, it comes down to people, right? Yeah. And again, we're already down. Um, so it was a tough conversation. And uh, um, historically, if you don't mind me just kind of jumping right into it, yeah, uh -uh. you know, historically, um, yeah, I'll use the mortgage crisis of 2008 as an example. <clears throat> um, when that happened, revenue dropped, right? The county was in very serious financial straits. And we, we, it, I wasn't there at the time, um, it had to eliminate 300 jobs. Traditionally, that process is done by the county executive going through the roster, making recommendations to the legislature. The legislature, so the, the, you know, the county executive has chartered authority to run the business of the county every day. That person is the CEO, okay? That's who Ryan McMahon is right now, the CEO of Onondaga County. Um, I would liken the legislature to its board of directors, a separate body with separate and distinct responsibility. So Ryan makes a recommendation or the county executive makes a recommendation and the legislature says, okay or not through approval process. And back then, uh, 300 people lost their job. It's a very straightforward, straightforward process. Well, I think anyone that's lived in the past eight months um, can validate that there's nothing straightforward about what's happening in our country, what's happening as a result of COVID. And um, I think a traditional approach to this, I, I firmly believe this um, personnel situation would have been um, a great disservice to taxpayers, an even bigger disservice to our employees um, who ultimately have families, have livelihoods. And you know, the truth is after um, temporary financial setbacks like this, all those people come back. So what, what are we really truly accomplishing with the traditional approach. The and easy with, with, I just want to interrupt. For, um, for the traditional approach, you mean like counting up who need like jobs, if how many jobs needs to go away? Right, right. Right. Going right through the roster saying this position stays, this position goes, this position stays, this position goes. Right. And, and then taking a uh, formulaic approach because 85% of the county government is, 85% uh, of the employees are part of a collective bargaining unit, part of a union. So, there's a, a lot of complicated, um, let's call it uh, administrative gymnastics, uh, collective bargaining, negotiation that's involved in things like this. And um, the success or failure of, of the county's workforce in terms of productivity really stems upon having a, a good relationship with, um, with the unions, a productive relationship where there's some give and take and negotiation when need be. And up until, um, very recently, you know, naturally, 
you know, the unions were pretty dug in. You're not going to get rid of anybody. Um, there was all kinds of discussions about furloughs and things like that. And uh, all they, all it was, was, was kind of talk, Shelly. It was nothing real and it was nothing meaningful um, because again, that traditional approach was looming on the horizon of a number of employees were going to be positions were going to be identified and they were just going to be cut. Right. And there was a lot of talk about, you know, from Maya not being part of the government, you know, we were hearing that how many job cuts are there going to be? There was, you know, guesstimations, people were trying to figure that out. So, um, you know, it was nice, at least from my end, it was nice to hear that you guys were giving that some solid thought on, you know, how can you prevent that from happening being the traditional? So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but on our side, we were hearing it as well, you know? Oh, it definitely made the news. (laughs) for sure. (laughs) A lot of talk about it. And, 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 and so it should. I mean, there's people's livelihoods, families' well-being at stake. And um, at the same time, you know, you can't lose sight of the fact, Shelly, that taxpayers are dealing with this in exactly the same way. And, you know, I couldn't help like kind of, you know, when I'm processing it, I mean, I, I went through some really tough times it, where, where I work with, with our staff and how we endured the situation. So did every other private employer out there. That's 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 life in in this circumstance. Um, thing is, it happened a while ago, right? It happened back in April, May. That's when companies were making decisions. Some as soon as March, you know, when the shutdown happened. Where's a restaurant going? What's a bar going to do? You know, what's a hair salon going to do? Right. So right. They, it, that's it. You know, people aren't working. They're not making money. It's it's a scary thought. Well, in government, because we tax for a good portion of this year already, you know, we knew we could persist to a certain point. Well, last month we got to that point where, okay, there's no more, you know, talking about personnel situations. We have to do something. So it had to be very clear that the legislature, and again, I'm not talking about talking for any individual legislator. I never do that, but by virtue of how we passed this law, the legislature decided that, look, we're ready and willing to do whatever it takes. But we got outside the box. We took a slightly different approach. And I think this is what made a huge difference in people's lives, both from an employee standpoint, from a taxpayer resident standpoint, because instead of taking the traditional approach, we decided um, we're going to treat our solution um, in a fluid way, just as COVID has been fluid throughout. So our solution really needs to give us, the leadership of Onondaga County, that means the legislature and uh, the executive side, the ability to work together, collaborate, monitor, Uh, revenues, sales tax revenue in particular, monitor the federal government. What are they going to do for for, for these municipalities that have been really hurt by this? If anything, we we don't know. Um, And and so on. And really take a more strategic, out-of-the-box approach. And And the solution wasn't the traditional solution. It was to say, we're going to work together to um, use and use every arrow in our quiver to find ways to mitigate job loss, to cut expenses, to keep families whole, to keep residents being served, to keep people who rely on services, that's very important, um, keep them able to receive those services at a time when they probably shall need them the most. So um, that did not go over well with six of my colleagues. The reason for that, the reasons were varied. Some of it, which I won't get into, was a little political. Some of it was, we don't do things that way. We don't pass chartered authority to the county executive. We don't share chartered authority to the county executive. We don't do things like that. And, um, you know, and, and we're not going to pass that on but the alternative was cutting 250 jobs. Well, and so I just want to interrupt for one, one second here, because I think with COVID, not just in local government, but in businesses everywhere, when you have saying think outside the box, 
when I look at the last, what, eight months, there's been so much thinking outside the box. So when you said those, those six people, you know, and they had their reason, sometimes it's just yep, fear, fear, it's fear of change. We've done it this way. It's worked. Let's stay the course and come out the other end better. Um, so it's scary to, to make that change. But, you know, in listening to you, and I, I know we have a few people, you know, watching this and they're, they're commenting every once in a while, but, but, but I think it is like, you know, if you don't, if you do the same thing, if you do what you do the same way all the time, you get the same results by thinking outside the box and trying to save those jobs and those resources, because like you said, people, people need those. Uh, it's not just government losing jobs. People are losing jobs left and right. And some people who thought they were safe two weeks ago just got furloughed this past week. So it's still a trickling effect Absolutely. down through, so the, not just the county, the state, the, you know, the country, but um, so I just wanted to interject in the fact that I think thinking outside the box, like I commend those of you for doing it. And, you know, so I'll, I'll let you continue with the story, but I just, I felt it was important to be like that. To me, that's huge. And I can't speak for everybody that's, you know, watches this, um, this interview, but, but I think you have to think outside the box in times of COVID and pandemic. So I agree. I mean, you know, and you know, the, I would say this to folks, you know, the legislature is 17 people. And every one of those legislators brings something to the table. Um, several of us bring considerable private sector experience to the government process. I'm one of those people. Um, actually, my contribution is very, very boring. It's <laughs> it's sort of business of the county government. That's it. But but in cases like this, you know, where you know, if you want to thrive, if you want to survive, if you want to succeed, you can't just stick to the same old same old way and this is definitely one of those circumstances and and as a result um you know our solution that passed shelly allowed the county executive to use pretty much any resource available to him to create that financial solution we needed so we reopened voluntary retirement so people could do take that route. We, 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 because we took a stance and said, no, by we, the legislature said, no, we're willing to do whatever it takes. That's a different message to the union side of things that says, now we got to talk. Now we have to come up with solutions. The solutions with the union, great one, one that everybody wanted from day one was furloughs, combination of voluntary and mandatory furloughs that allow people to leave work for a period of time, I, you know, by choice, or in some cases, not by choice, depending on what the position is or what the job entails. Right. So between those two things, you know, it really limited um, the, the total number of, of jobs lost. There were 15 positions that were um, abolished that uh, were just not going to exist anymore. And then there were actually seven layoffs. If you remember, uh, um, all told, I think, Shelly, 86 people were affected, seven layoffs, 15 positions. Besides that, everybody's coming back. Everybody, the rest of those are, are disrupted. They haven't lost their job. They haven't lost their livelihood. They're in a position where the future is bright despite the problems of today. Um, I'll take that solution and, and, and I can't forget this, taxpayers, are getting what they need, they're getting what they're paying for in their taxes. There is not a disruption of service. The people who need the help the most are still getting it. And that is so important. Is it easy for anybody? Absolutely not. No. It is not fun at the legislature right now. It is not fun in these county departments. It's not fun for these folks that are shouldering a bigger load than they ever have because of these circumstances. But that's the way it is for everybody, isn't it? And right. and we're all getting through it. And yeah, the county's dealing with it later than the private world per se. But at the end of the day, the county's dealing with it too. So um, and that's appropriate and that's fair. And um, and again, um, I'll take this solution over the alternative or the traditional approach any day of the week. And here's the best news of all because we're taking this approach in sort of a systematic process and using all these tools, it buys us time, 
right? To figure out what needs to happen next, okay? And it also lets us watch because sales tax payments come in at increments throughout the year. Here's some great news. The sales tax payments since this, this, this decision has been made have exceeded expectations. What does that mean? That means we might have a shot at getting to the end of the year without doing anything else or what we do may be certainly at the very least, Shelly, much less than we thought we had to do. And I can assure you one thing at this point with a great degree of confidence, provided the schools don't shut down and the colleges don't send everybody home and just, they just don't even know you're fine. <laughs> right, yeah, Friday that doesn't happen. You know, we're on a great path for a super solution. So while I respect my colleagues who voted the other way um, all day long, um, I am, I've never been more confident that we did the right thing on the basis of probably two or three things. One is first and foremost, trust. So that's very uncharacteristic in government. We had to trust our co-equal branch, the administration to do the right thing. Now, don't get me wrong. We didn't say, hey, just go ahead and do your best. We said, hey, we want a weekly report or a report anytime something happens, anytime something changes, we need to know about it because we have the right to rescind that authority anytime we want. We need to be part of the solution, not um, um, sitting back and watching things happen. And that's what we've been ever since. And the county executive has been great. I mean, the day he implemented all these things within Shelly, I wanna say a half an hour of taking care of the last item, he was on the phone to me, giving me details on exactly what happened so that I could um, be informed and inform my caucus that, hey, here's what's going on. Here's what we approved. This is what we bargained for. This is a great result. And then to have downstream news on increased sales tax revenue, a revenue that exceeded expectations. It's not a great year for sales tax, it's horrible, but we're getting more than we anticipated. That really, really helps our position going toward the end of the year. Um, sadly, uh, and this is unfortunate, uh, we, you know, COVID in this situation doesn't care about our calendar. It doesn't care about our tax year, um, which by the way, our tax year is on the other side of, of um, well, our year does not coincide with the state's year. So we won't find out things about the New York state budget until way late in um, well into 2021. We hear rumors. Now our job as the fiscal policymakers is to be prepared for all of that. Not easy. Um, you know, we really gotta be thinking worst case, worst case, worst case all the way through. Um, I think there's a commitment from the administration and certainly a desire from, from uh, the legislative side to try to uh, keep everything um, the same, not increase taxes. I think there's a strong desire for that. Um, we, as a way to help us get to that point, we all agreed to stall our annual budget process, which I would normally be completing right now. We're not doing it until November. He's not presenting the budget to us until the first week of November. Thereafter, the once he presents it to us, the legislature gets to work. There's a reason for that. We need to see how things shake out this year. We need to see what the final impact is gonna be. We need to know how much of our reserves we're gonna consume. And um, again, trust. We, 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 we definitely, and this is uncharacteristic of government these days, we are saying we're gonna collaborate, we're gonna trust, and we're gonna work shoulder to shoulder with the administration to try to get through this in a way that, it, that helps every single stakeholder, right down to the person paying their property taxes. That's critical. And that's the decision we made. Um, I'm proud of the folks that did vote for this because um, I'm particularly proud of the result. And it's, it's a good thing for everybody involved. You know, um, the, the, the debate over this was tough. Um, you know, we all get over it over time. You know, the, the arguments were, were tough. And, and, and I will just in all, you know, honesty tell you that it wasn't a Republican Democrat thing. No. This was a chartered authority thing. You know, it, it, the, the vote clearly went down partisan lines. And so, you know, but that at the end of the day, 
but it wasn't easy for us to get where we needed to be because um, if anyone has paid attention to county government over the years, you know, the legislature and the administration as co-equal branches, believe it or not, aren't always seeing eye to eye. And, really? and, yeah. So um, I, I think Ryan's done a decent job of bringing everybody together, a real good job of bringing everybody together, but it doesn't change that dynamic. So um, it was a pretty heavy lift to get to this point, but man, am I happy we're here versus, and again, I'm not proud of anybody being impacted financially. It stinks. No, but but do you think, I, I know you said you can go down party lines, but I, I do you think though that's because at the end of the day, this isn't a party issue, this is a livelihood issue. So you almost have to do the best that you think you're doing for the livelihood of the county, for the livelihood of you know the villages, the towns, and everybody that's counting on you to, to do it. So it's, you know, again, anything can be political, anything good on the lines, I'm not saying that. But in this case, it's, are you going to, it's the people that let's be creative, let's be proactive, let's be, you know, um, think outside the box, as opposed to the tried and true. And each one of those things have their place. So I agree with you in not being harsh on people that didn't vote the way that it went. Um, because there's, there's a place for tried and true as well. Um, but well, yeah, small and, businesses, and every, everybody had to start um, we, you know, I'm, I'm a Beville person, right? And, um, you know, a lot of businesses, it, they thrive because they thought outside the box. And it seems like that's what you guys are doing as well. Yeah. And it's uncharacteristic for government, isn't it? You know, so, um, but again, that, that comes from, um, you know, private sector people really doing their best to try to drive a, a strategy or plan. Uh, it comes from people that have really excellent experience with union negotiations, for example that uh, like from within our caucus, we happen to have one member, uh, Jim Rowley, who really understands the dynamics of that better than anyone. And, uh, you know, he did a nice job kind of bringing that into our discussion and how, you know, if we didn't do this, all the stakeholders, the ledge, the administration, the union leaderships, and there's really, you know, three or four big ones that are of consideration here, they're all gonna dig in. And it's just gonna be argue, 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 Time's going to get lost, money's going to get lost, and the number of people that we would have had to lay off in traditional methods would have only kept going up every day that goes by. So, uh, again, you know, regardless of how people voted, I'm really proud of the process and the outcome in this case because the outcome so far was really good. Again, things could change tomorrow, Shelley, and I could have egg all over my face, but um, but so far so good. Um, and I just, again, I think the, 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 the encouraging part of this was that as hot and intense as the debate was, and in over eight years, I've never seen anything like this, over eight years, mm -hmm. um, people came together, people had open minds to change them and say, I get it. I'm, I'm a tried and true legislator that's always done things a certain way and we don't give the administration anything and we don't do this. And they listened, they thought about it, uh, argued about it <laughs> and, and, and went that way. And then, you know, on the other side of the equation, sadly, there were some that actually said, oh, they're passing the buck. I'm like, passing the buck, are you kidding me? But that wasn't the case. Um, that was taking a giant chance because if we were wrong, oh my goodness. But, you know, there's no buck being passed. That the, the the decision we made actually created more work for everybody involved, and um, it was a, it was a it was a good outcome. Nice. Well, I um I appreciate the information, all of it. You know, from talking about live streaming to obviously the the budget, which everybody's concerned about. Um, is there anything else like going on? Um, you know, we didn't talk about yesterday, but that you thought about after we hung up yesterday that you kind of wanted to mention to people today. Well, I think that and I kind of hinted around it in a couple different instances here. We're doing a budget, and I like what's happening here as well. We're doing a budget at the end of the year. Um, I don't like the fact that we're backed into a corner as we were as backed into a corner as we are, which makes the work again. Typically, it's Shelley three to four weeks of very very intense work. Uh, two weeks in the middle of that are just constant budget hearings, work sessions, caucus where the, it, it's just, it's a ton of work. That's, that is the most important thing that the Ondog County Legislature does for taxpayers was, is determine the cost of government. One of the arguments we had along the way was someone talking about the essential workers and how we're not 
taking into consideration essential versus non-essential and, and all these things. It was an argument, valid, um, but there's no essential workers without a budget to pay them. So what's essential and what isn't? It's all interrelated. And, and so this budget process that's coming up is gonna include some really tough decisions because as I said, 2021 isn't gonna be easy either. And we're not gonna know the full impact from New York State until then. Hopefully we got our fingers crossed. The federal government may come through with some form of aid for municipalities, which would be great for us. If they do, that will help mitigate what we anticipate from the state. But we're approaching budget, again, in collaboration with the county executive and the administration, um, knowing that we aren't gonna be able to do everything that we wanna do. We've already done capital review, the big projects, the money we spent. It's going to be, Shelly, fractional compared to what the plans were, fractional. I'm talking like, unless some kind of big opportunity comes along in 2021, it's unplanned for. Um, we will be talking about a capital plan, capital plan expenditures, that which we borrow for, that which we borrow for um, being somewhere in the neighborhood of about a fifth of what we normally would do. And that's just, again, a plan for a real conservative year. And, you know, we've um, tried to eliminate some of the budget process that tends to be ceremonial, pomp and circumstance. Some county departments, there's 60 of them, come in and they want to give you an annual report when you're trying to figure out their budget. We can't have that. And I, when I was Ways and Means Chair, we got rid of some of that. Um, some of it we kept. That which we kept, we're pushing into program committees in prior months so that when we get to the budget in that short window of time, we're able to make some great decisions so that, again, every effort can be made to not raise taxes as a result of this utter mess that we're in. Well, I, I'm definitely hoping for that. Um, that 2020 has that surprise that we don't see coming, kind of like the sales tax revenue being higher. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't know what you don't know. And if you just plan right. day by day and sometimes having that worst case scenario attitude actually allows for uh, greater things to, to happen and be prepared for. That's right. Well, I thank your time for your time and your, all the information. I love sitting here talking to you about this and, and getting an idea of what's going on. Hopefully, um, you know, those people watching, I didn't really see any questions, just a lot of things like agreement as far as thinking outside the box, things like um, uh, cool. some, a couple comments for Ryan McMahon and, and what he's done for uh, the county and just, you know, the appreciation of that. So, um, but if I get any other questions through the comments as this plays and plays and plays or in the town, um, when I'm walking around the village, I'll reach out to you to get those answers. Absolutely. And, and, have questions. and I think I mentioned it last time. I'll mention it again. I, I keep my contact information on the county website on gov.net. So if anybody ever has a question or wants to talk about anything pertaining to the county government, they can just give me a call or send me an email. I always get back to whoever it is even if I dread the conversation, which sometimes happens, <laughs> but, uh, but by and large, um, um, I always call people back. So um, I'd love to hear from folks if they have things they want to talk about. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Brian. Thank you, Shelly. I enjoyed it.